1958 was the year that Sony defined the shirt pocket transistor radio with its successful TR610 model, a radio that actually did fit in a shirt pocket. That year, how many American radio makers met that competition by introducing a full-featured shirt pocket transistor radio of their own? Well, let's see. Not Admiral. Not Arvin. Not GE. Not Hoffman. Not Magnavox. Not Motorola. Not Raytheon. Not RCA. Not Sylvania. Not Traveler. Not Westinghouse. Not Zenith. Philco gave it a shot, at least, in 1958, with their earphone-only Veep radio. But without a speaker, you can't call it a full-featured radio. Only one American brand managed to introduce a new full-featured shirt pocket radio in 1958. Emerson. We covered this terrific 999 Champion model of theirs in a recent video. Besides the Emerson, nothing. Just Emerson. But I'll bet that next year, in 1959, the American makers inundated the market with all kinds of pocket models, with all kinds of improvements. Those are crickets. Seriously. That was the American maker's response to the Sony, and the swarm of other great little radios finding their way to American shores from dozens of other Japanese brands. Crickets from the American makers. Finally, in late 1959, one American brand managed to jolt itself awake enough to try to meet the challenge, releasing its first shirt pocket radio, RCA Victor. The Radio Corporation of America and the Victor Talking Machine Company had merged in 1929 to become RCA Victor, arguably the first media conglomerate of the electronic age. RCA Victor was into network broadcasting, the record business, and made the radios and record players on which to play it all. And at the beginning of the transistor era, RCA was there with their pioneering 7BT9J from 1955. That's it on the top in this picture. Not a pocket size model, but smaller than the first Philco transistor that it's sitting on here. In December of 1959, this ad appeared, introducing RCA's first shirt pocket radio the 1TP2 model. That's the radio we're looking at today. But notice in the ad that they had already been making larger transistor radios, and that's what all the American makers had been doing throughout the late 1950s, making larger radios in sizes we call the coat pocket size, the even larger portable size, uh, and the tabletop models. One could argue that such large radios sounded better with their large speakers and performed better. But what many people really wanted at the time was a shirt pocket size radio. This was no secret. The first transistor radio, the Regency TR1 from 1954, was shirt pocket size, or nearly so. To Regency, and most of the rest of us, that was the point of having transistors instead of tubes, radios that could fit in your shirt pocket. When RCA's little radio arrived in 1959, it had been a full five years since the Regency TR1. As you can see, the RCA is quite an elegant little radio and it has the nostalgic touch of their old logo featuring the dog named Nipper, who is looking into a phonograph because he believes he hears coming from it his master's voice. 
That was their slogan, His Master's Voice. RCA dubbed this radio the Pocket Personal. There's a name chosen by a committee if I ever heard one. Pictured on the operating instructions are two models, the 1TP1 with a plastic front and the 1TP2, which has a metal front. Both models were apparently issued simultaneously. We'll look at them side by side in a little bit. Notice in the instructions that the radio takes a 4-volt battery. Now, such a battery would be as hard to find then as it is today. Back then, where would you find it? Not at a drugstore or even at a hardware store. Only a radio shop, the same shop where you bought the radio. And that was the point to many of the American radio makers, using these odd batteries to keep you coming back to their dealer's stores. It's a handsome-looking box in gold and red. Nestled inside is the radio, the case and strap, and the earphone in its own plastic box. This is what's known as a gift box, and that explains why it says inside, the gift that keeps on giving. Many radios came in such boxes, and also were sold in a more modest and smaller box with fewer or no accessories. The case here is worthless. Dolled up to look like leather, it is little more than a piece of cardboard. It only survives here in pristine condition because it's barely been used. Best not to touch it. It's brittle and as stiff as, well, cardboard. Earphone set RK219A for RCA Victor Instruments. Hmm, I like that. That sounds impressive. And speaking of impressive, what a beautiful little radio this is. As we look around the sides, we see scuffing, and this is another reason I have such disdain for the cheap cardboard cases. They scratched the radios. I really don't see how a cardboard case should be any part of a deluxe gift set. While foreign-made radios had to be labeled with their country of origin, by law, on the outside of their cabinets, usually on the back somewhere, there was no such requirement for U.S.-made radios sold here. And so most American-made radios are not marked with country of origin. RCA was pushing back at the imports when, though not required, it said on the back of this radio that it was made in the USA. And not abbreviated either. It says, Made in United States of America. It's an impressive piece of work inside. The most impressive thing I see being the size of that open-air tuning capacitor. I don't think I've ever seen a smaller one. They were determined not to give in and use one of those little Mitsumi tuning capacitors from Japan, as General Electric and Motorola would do a little later, in 1960, with their first shirt pocket radios. RCA was keeping it all American. Here's a form the buyer fills out with date and details of purchase. This folder talks about warranty and repair service and lists 10 service center locations around the U.S. to which you can mail your pocket for repairs. We talked about the gift box, and I mentioned other non-gift boxes that are sometimes seen. Here is this RCA radio in one of those. There's no room here for an earphone, a battery, or that crappy case that you don't want anyway. In the big box, I found a little sales flyer for the radio that shows it actual size. This flyer got tucked in the box at some point, but it wouldn't have come originally with the radio. Where would you get such a flyer? At a radio dealer. While you were in there buying some oddball battery for some other RCA thing. And now that you have this flyer, you want this thing. 
See how this works? All American Transistor Portable, the Pocket Personal, Model 1TP2, the finest pocket size miniature radio for better overall performance, unparalleled performance with exclusive high T circuit for broader tonal response, improved fidelity. Oh yeah, high T. And crumpets. Exclusive new miniature high impedance speaker provides clear room filling sound. Non breakable impact case guaranteed in writing for five years of normal use. RCA All American Transistor Radio. Made in America by American craftsmen with all American components. I appreciate the sentiment, RCA. I really do. But where have you been? You're just two years too late. As much as that criticism of RCA is deserved, I do temper it with the realization that many people did want the larger radios RCA and the others made, and that RCA was under a kind of attack from all sides. There was a Japanese brand that named itself RCA, Royal Crest Airway. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So they were having to deal with that kind of trademark nonsense, and here at home, these thieves were ripping off the RCA styling to make a buck with their American-made 10 transistor. This forgery is almost comical in the way it rips off the front of the RCA, but not its side, the unique way the RCA's back and front fit together. No. This jewel radio rips that off from the Zenith Royal 50. The barrage of American pocket radios that should have happened in 1958 finally did happen in 1960, kicked off by RCA's little pocket. All the major brands finally entered the field, launching a two- or three-year golden age of attractive and interesting American shirt pocket transistor radios. Better late, I guess, than never. <laughs>